Okay. So this is the lecture where I give you the formula for the determinant. So here are the determinants of a two by two and a three by three matrix. Remember the determinant of a two by two matrix is the sum of two terms or the difference of two terms rather. One of them is the product of the diagonal entries and the other is the product of the off diagonal entries. And the determinant of a three by three matrix is a combination of six terms. Here they are. In each one of these six terms is a product of some of the entries in the matrix. So in this formula, I'm going to give you the corresponding formula. In this lecture, I'm going to give you the corresponding formula for the determinant of an n by n matrix. But I want to emphasize, you don't compute determinants by knowing this formula, not for n four or greater. You compute determinants by row reduction. And knowing this formula is much less useful than knowing the properties of a determinant. Okay, our two by two determinant is the sum or the difference of two terms. And the three by three determinant is the, pro is the sum of six terms. One, two, three, four, five, six. Our n by n determinant is going to be the product of n factorial. That's one times two times three times dot 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 times n terms. Each one of these terms is going to come from some rearrangement, some permutation of the numbers one through n. So rearrangement, is, so let me just first give you an example to make sure we're all clear about what I'm talking about. Here are the six permutations of one, two, three. One, two, I can write the numbers in order. I can switch the order of the first two. I can switch the order of the last two. I can cycle them two, three, one. I can cycle them three, one, two. I can switch the order of the first and third. So when I say a rearrangement or a permutation, I mean some way of putting things in order. So here I've used the word rearrangement because I think that's the English word you folks are likely to know. And then I've told you the mathematical term, which I'll use in the rest of these slides is permutation. Your book for some reason uses the word pattern and I find that very weird. That is neither the standard mathematical term, nor is it an English word which gives you the right intuition. So I'm gonna use the word permutation and think, when I say permutation, think rearrangement. Oh, it's a way of putting these things into order. And anyways, the point is I'm going to, there are n factorial ways of putting n things in order I'm gonna sum up those n factorial things. And for each permutation, my corresponding term will be x1 sigma one, x2 sigma two, and so forth. So here I've listed my permutations in the same order that my summands appear here. So for example, this summand here, whoops, this summand here, x1, two, x2, three, x3, three, one, that's the permutation two, three, one, because it's one sigma of one, two sigma of two, three sigma of three. Okay, and here I've written out all six permutations for you. So here's that two, three, one example again. And I've also showed you a geometric way of displaying them, which I find very useful. I can think about them as selecting n out of the n squared entries in my matrix. And I select them in such a way that every row and every column has exactly one entry selected from it. Okay, so here's what I've told you so far. I've told you my formula is going to be a sum with n factorial terms, those terms coming from the permutations of one through n. And the thing I'm gonna be summing up is this product x1 sigma one, x2 sigma two, et cetera, xn sigma m. The only thing I haven't told you is whether to use a plus sign or a minus sign. And telling you that is going to be a little bit hard and take some time. But I want to emphasize that's the only detail left. If you ignored the plus and minus signs for a moment, then I would be done. The formula would be sum up one term for each permutation and the term for the permutation is this product. So all I have to do is tell you the sign. Well, here's the answer. Um, the sign is going to be the number of ordered pairs ij 
for which one is less or equal to i, less than j, less or equal to n, and sigma of i is greater than sigma of j. That's a bit of a mouthful, so let's see an example. Okay, here is an example of a permutation when n equals six. I've shown it to you in three ways. I have boxed the entries in my matrix. I've written out the product down below my matrix, and I've written out the corresponding permutation here. And what I want to do is I want to compute the number of pairs ij for which i is less than j, but sigma of i is greater than sigma of j. So I like to do that geometrically by looking at this picture. And then once I've done that, I will also talk about doing it looking at this formula for sigma if that's easier for some of you. So what I'm going to be looking for is I'm going to be looking for two rows, row i and row j, where i is above j, that's this inequality, but sigma of i over here is to the right of sigma of j. That's this inequality. So in other words, I want one of my entries to be northeast and the other southwest of each other. So one such pair ij, like in this formula, is this pair here. The sigma of four, uh, four and six is one of these ordered pairs. And I can also see it by looking at the numerical values. Four is less than six. And sigma of four, which is three, is greater than sigma of six, which is two. So geometrically, I'm going to be looking for places where one entry is northeast of the other. And let me just mark all the other such places for you on this picture. There's a bunch of them. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. All in all, I found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I found eight such pairs. So my sign is negative one to the eight, which is positive one. So in this case, there was an even number of pairs. So this permutation would show up with a plus sign in my determinant. Okay. I have now completed telling you the full formula. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run through the properties of determinant and show you how each of those properties follows for our formula. And the first property I'm going to do is rescaling a row. So here's a three by three determinant. And I've multiplied the bottom row of this matrix by the scalar C. Well, every term in my determinant uses exactly one entry from the bottom row. So every one of these monomials has exactly one entry that gets rescaled. So I can factor a C out of everything and get it short off this determinant is C times this determinant. Good, so that works. My next one is going to be adding two vectors in one row. So let's say my bottom row is vector y plus vector z. Well, once again, every term in my determinant uses exactly one, uh, every product in my determinant uses exactly one factor from that row. So I'm gonna have exactly one y plus z in each of these. If I distribute this out, I'm going to get so for example, if I to, when I distribute this first term here out, when I distribute this term, I'm gonna get x11, x22, y3, that's over here, and x11, x22, z3, that's over here. And similarly, each of the terms here is gonna split up into two terms here and here, and I'm gonna get this determinant plus this determinant, just like I promised you. And then the last one, the tricky one, is the sign. 
So let's see what happens if I switch two rows. So in this example, I have switched rows two and three. The difference between the top matrix and the bottom matrix is that row two here is on the bottom, has moved to position three, and row three here has moved to position two. When I take the determinants, I have n factorial terms in both cases, and they have the same terms, except that the signs are different. So this term here occurs with a plus sign, and that same term over here occurs with a minus sign. So you can see it working in the example, and we'd like to know that it's right in general. So I'm going to check next, I'm going to check if this works in general. But let me be clear before we get to that, the only thing to do is check if the sign is right. It's, we've already checked the other two properties of determinant, rescaling a row and adding two vectors in the same row. And it's already clear that we're going to get the same n factorial terms here and here. The only thing you do is check what sign they show up with. So what we need to know is that if I switch two rows of a matrix and I'm looking at some particular permutation, I will switch the sign of that permutation. So in this example, I have switched rows one and five in this matrix. This other matrix over here is exactly the same, except row five has moved to first position and row one has moved to fifth position. And I wanna check, so we computed before that this guy has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight pairs out of order. This other guy has one, two, three, four, five, uh, it's going to be a little bit cluttered, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. This guy has 11 pairs out of order. So this first one comes with sign negative one to the eight, which is positive. The second guy comes with sign negative one to the 11, which is negative. And we want to know that that's right in general. We want to know that the number of out of order pairs of this guy with one pair of rows switched has the opposite parity from this case. Okay, so I'm gonna to explain to you now why that's right, but that's the thing I'm trying to explain. I'm trying to explain why when I switched rows one and five, the number of things that were, uh, orient, that were on Northeast Southwest changed by an odd number, in this case three from eight to 11. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. So first of all, the entries in rows one and five themselves definitely change positions. Right here, they're in order. Here they are northwest, southeast. Here they are northeast, southwest. So that's one thing that changes. If it were the only thing it would change, we'd, do, we'd be great. But life is a little bit more complicated. If we also look at anything which is in the middle, which is inside this rectangle, then that guy is also going to change relative positions. So this X43 is north, is southeast of X11, whereas after the switch, it becomes Northeast. And similarly, X43 is Northwest of X54 over here, but Southwest of X54 over here. So each of these edges on the left-hand side switches from a Northwest-Southeast orientation over to a Northeast-Southwest orientation on the other side. The total number of things that change is first of all, the entries in rows A and B themselves. So that's one thing that changes. And then each guy inside this rectangle gives rise to two more things that change sign. 
And so all in all, we change the contribution of an odd number of things. So we flip the sign and we see that we have indeed proved the last property, but switching two rows changes the sign of the determinant. Okay. So we have now proved if our determinant rescales when we rescale a row, adds when we add vectors in one row, switches sign when we switch two rows, and of course, same is true for columns. And these were the properties that we used to prove everything else about determinant. So we now have proved that this formula given by this sum over n factorial permutations does have all the properties that I promised you. Determinants can be computed by row reduction, the determinant of A is non-zero if it only if A is invertible. Well, we had lots of other things equivalent to that, which I've started listing here in parentheses. And the determinant of A, B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Okay, this is the main moral of this lecture. I have given you a formula for determinant and checked that that formula has all these properties and therefore it also has these other really good properties. I would like to stop there, but I need to issue a warning. Here's the warning. Some people have learned the following trick for computing three by three determinants, and I wish they hadn't. What they do is they draw their three by three matrix. Here it is. Here are the entries of my matrix. They copy the first and second columns over here, and they draw slanty lines like this. And they write down the product of each of those six slanty lines. And for the downward slanting lines, they put a plus. And for the upward slanting lines, they put a minus. This trick works for two by two matrices. It works by for three by three matrices and it stops working after that. If you've never learned this, don't learn it now. I don't want you to get these details right. I wanna make sure you don't use this method for larger matrices. So I'm just gonna point out why it is wrong for larger matrices. So, here is a four by four matrix. I'm gonna try the same idea trick. I will copy over columns one, two, three, and I will draw my slanty lines. And I have drawn eight slanty lines here. If I add them up, I get a sum of eight terms. The determinant has four factorial, which is 24 terms. I have only gotten a third of the terms of my determinant this is not going to give the right formula. So please don't do this when n is four or larger. Okay, but I don't like to end on a warning. Let me end on a happy note. We are, so you now have a formula for the determinant and we've proved that, that formula has the basic properties that make determinant important. And using those basic properties, we can prove that determinants can be computed by row reduction, that yeah, testing whether a determinant is zero tests all sorts of other important things about your matrix. And that determinant multiplies when you multiply matrices. And that's all I have to say for now. <laughs>